we've been studying the purple book. We've been learning how to be disciples and how to make disciples and what God says about all of that. So that's what we've been doing. So last week, we discussed being a church family, how to be unified and how God multiplies when we are in unity with one another. So and what are those, those things? Biblical teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer and worship. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to dig a little further into that prayer and worship part of it and see what God has to say about it. Now, before I get into kind of, I guess, the message part of it, I got to share something a little personal with you guys. You guys okay with me doing that? You're not going to judge me, right, if I share some, something personal with you guys? When Pastor Elvin and I were first dating, we would get together and he would always love to pray. He loved to pray. We would hold hands and bow our heads and he would always pray. And I'd be like, okay, I kind of like this guy. I'd call my girlfriend up and say, ooh, I kind of like this one. He likes to pray. And it would always touch my heart when he would pray. It was just the best thing. And so we would do this kind of week after week. Every day we'd pray together, whether it was on the phone, whether it was in person. Then one day, I assumed the position. I held, we were holding hands, and I bowed my head, and he paused. I said, okay, well, wait. You're supposed, that's the part you're supposed to pray with. And he said, oh, no, now it's your turn to pray. Uh... All of a sudden, it got hot. My hands were sweating. You know that little drip of sweat that goes down the middle of your back? Like, where did that come from? Like, how did that happen all of a sudden immediately? And so I, I, I was like, wait a minute. Everything was going so good. I was the good agreeer in prayer. Amen. Yes, I could do that part. But now, he wants me to pray. He wants to mess up a good thing that we had going. God was moving when he prayed, but now he wanted me to pray. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know how to do this. He just totally messed up. And the thing is, I couldn't pray that, that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I couldn't do that because that's not how he prayed. He didn't pray by just saying that. And, and the thing is, when he prayed, it was like heaven moved. The anointing, the power of God, the conviction, the presence of God was there every single time he prayed. But he expected me to now pray this heaven moving prayer. How in the world was I ever going to compete, as I thought, with that? So my question to you guys is who has ever felt like that when it came to prayer? Maybe not now, but you have in the past felt that way. Amen? Okay, so I'm not the only one. No judgment here. All of us have felt that way. But you know what? God knows this. God knows everything. He knows how intimidating it is to come to an almighty God and pray. What do you say to him? So... What he has done is he has given us a template to pray with. He has given us a, a way to pray because he loves us so much and doesn't want our communication to not happen because we don't have a way to pray with for everything that's going on in our lives. So today's sermon title is Pray This Way way. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at some scripture that we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. Because this is the model that he gave us to pray when we start praying. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. So if you have your Bible, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, the words are like this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. 
May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So we've all heard this. We've all heard this prayer. So Jesus is trying to help us with our prayer life. He's given us an outline to follow. But if you notice, what is the very first thing that he says? He says, pray like this. He said, pray like this. Did he say, repeat everything that I said? Did he say, go verbatim, word for word, everything that I told you to say? No, he says, pray like this. Pray this way. We don't repeat what he says, but it's a guide, a template, or an outline when it comes to prayer. So what I really want to kind of dig into today is looking at all of the elements that are inside of the Lord's Prayer, as we so call it. Because there's a significance in the things that he told us to pray when he outlined the Lord's Prayer to us. So we're just going to go and dive right in and I'm going to show you what and why it's there in the Lord's Prayer. The first thing, first thing that we talk about, it says our Father in heaven. He talks about relationship. Us as Christians, what make us different than all of the other quote unquote religions out there is relationship. The most important thing that we have is our relationship to God and our relationship to others. Amen? Amen. The two biggest commandments, the two most important commandments. So when we are praying our Father in heaven, it is our recognition as to who he is. Our Abba, Father, Daddy, Father in heaven, acknowledging who he is and our relationship with him. We are his children. It shows that we understand that we are his children. That's so important when it comes to prayer because it, it reminds us and him, you know what? You want to take care of me. You, what daddy, what father? We all have been in father-daughter relationships. We've all been in father-son relationships. We know daddies want to help their children, right? So when we say our father in heaven, we're just acknowledging that he's our father. He is not some distant person out there that, you know, maybe he'll hear our prayer. Maybe he won't. He always does. Amen. Amen. All right. The second part, reverence. May your name be kept holy. This is referring to who God is. It's referring to his character. Holy literally means set apart. So when we go to pray, we're praying to our daddy, but knowing that he is not like this common prayer that we pray for, oh, I'm, I'm you know, praying over something else and not to him. It's all about him. It's not just an ordinary prayer. There should be some awe and some wonder when it comes to praying to this heavenly father that we have. Amen. We, I mean, really, we are praising him for who he is, his grace, his mercy, his love, all of his attributes. That's what we're praying about when we say that we revere him. The next part that he reigns. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, a lot of times we pledge allegiance to a lot of stuff, to the flag, to the state, to the this, to the that. Our first allegiance should be pledged to him. Amen. Amen. For him, for his rule here on earth. Not our agenda, not someone else's agenda, but it's about him. We pray to align ourselves with God, not the other way around. We don't pray so that God aligns with what we want. We, we pray for have us aligned with what he wants. Amen? Amen? 
So that's what you're doing when you're talking about rain. Next part is request. Now our requests come into place. Give us today the food that we need. Now we request some things. And, and I want to say this in our requests. Our purpose of presenting our requests to the Lord is so that we can fulfill what he called us to do. Okay, so this isn't like, okay, well, I'm going to go and I just, oh, because I like that. Ooh, that Cadillac over there looks good. No, it's about the things that you struggle with, the things that you have issues with. Lord, please help me in this situation. Help my mind, my body, and my spirit because I want to be who you called me to be. That's what the prayer is for. That's what the request is for, getting you out of the way of those things that are hindering you. And, and, and really, if you think about it, that request is not really for ourselves, it's for others. Because when that stuff happens, when God does all of that stuff, not only does it affect our lives, it gives us the ability to help others in their situations too. So those are the types of requests that he answers and that he blesses. Amen? All right, next, repentance. Oh, we don't like that R word, Sabrina. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Hmm. We have to recognize our shortcomings. We have to recognize and honestly and with humility and look at our lives and say, Lord, I'm just a broken vessel here. And I trust you. I honor you. I want your forgiveness so that nothing hinders me in my prayers. A lot of times we're hindered in what we're praying because we got unforgiveness for somebody else. And we don't ask for forgiveness for the stuff that, that we have done or sometimes what? In the middle of doing. We have to ask God. You're saying that, Lord, I want to see how you see my sin. Sometimes when we're in the middle of our sin, we don't see it the way God sees it. So you want the revelation to see what God sees to give you revelation on those things to ask for forgiveness. Amen? Amen. All right, next part of it. Rescue. Do not let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. <laughs> We all know we're all trying to, to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, but we also know that there's some opposition that comes with that. We already know that it's coming. We already know there's going to be some temptations that are coming. So here we're asking God, Lord, help us with those types of things. Help us when that temptation does come so that I don't fall. So that I don't fall for the okie doke of what I'm, they're trying to put me in, the trick bag they're trying to put me in. This is the recognition that we trust and we rely on him and that we're not trying to do things on our own. Our reliance is on him and him alone. So that's what we're doing there. Now, truly, this is an outline. It's an outline to assist us when we pray. And I'll tell you what, anybody can pray this outline and it turned into the most powerful prayer out there. It can touch both heaven and earth if you pray this prayer with your heart. But that's the thing. What makes a prayer powerful is the heart in which you pray it. I'll tell you what. Some of the most powerful prayers that I have ever heard have come from little children. They just have, they have no agenda. They may not have the biggest words, the biggest vocabulary, but I'm going to tell you, they have a heart and they're going to pray it. They trust God with everything that they have. And God touches that and makes it the most powerful thing that you have ever heard. I guess this is what I want to say. And this is what I want to put an exclamation point on. Don't get caught up in having the right words to say, but just make sure you have the right heart, heart with what you do say. That's what the most important thing is. He sees our hearts, not those words that come out of our mouth that sometimes don't even make any sense. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It's the heart in which you pray it. Amen? 
Yeah, because God didn't want us just rambling some random wish list. <laughs> That's why he gave us a guide so that we can pray. And I, and I want to say this. As we start praying, this is a starting point for prayer. As we start praying and we pray the Lord's Prayer, but put our heart into it, over time, God will start giving us the words to pray. He will share what he wants you to say in prayer. And that's really when he starts moving powerfully because you're praying his will, not your will. So just know this is your starting point. But as you again, remember, this is about relationship. When we pray and worship, it is about our relationship with the Lord. It's deepening our relationship with the Lord. And as that relationship deepens, we don't necessarily need to have a template because we can hear directly from him and he'll tell us what to say and what to pray. Amen. Amen. So I just wanted to share that with you guys because sometimes we struggle. We do. I, I even though it's been a while since I've, I've been that when we were dating a long time ago, I sometimes still use this Lord's Prayer as my template because I'll tell you what, there are times in my life, there have been times in my life where, you know what, Lord, I just want to tell her off. I just want, gee, this person has just gotten on my nerves and I don't have the right heart in which to pray. So I'm like, okay, Lord, let me pause. Relationship. Lord, this is about you. It's not about me. I, and I try to go through those things so that I can, I can stay in alignment with him and not pray what I'm really thinking and what I'm really feeling. Amen. Y'all hear me. <laughs> so it's important sometimes kind of keep that in front of you in your prayer life. But I also wanted to give you an example in the Bible of a powerful prayer, some powerful prayer and worship that happened. And if you are following us in the purple book, you have probably already read this or you will read this next week. But I want to give you a little background. It's, it's in Acts 16. We're going to talk a little bit about Paul and Silas. OK, Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas were God's chosen men to go out and teach in, in towns and teach about God's word and about Jesus and just spreading the word about Jesus. While they were doing this, many people were healed. They were saved. They were baptized. They were even set free. But it really made some people mad because they were making money off of fortune tellers and Paul delivered or set free a person that was fortune telling, that was going and telling people their fortunes. Now, let me say this about fortune telling. Fortune telling is a spirit, but it is not a spirit of God. Amen. So when Paul delivered this girl and she had no more power to do this fortune telling anymore, well, the people that owned her got mad. So they're like, OK, we got to do something about this. We're going to do something about this Paul and this Silas that's costing us money. So what did they do? They got mad. They dragged Paul and Silas to the city officials, to the head of the city and claimed that they were teaching customs that were illegal. That pretty much they were disturbing the peace and teaching a new religion that was not of the, the city, the Roman city that they lived in, in Philippi. So Paul and Silas, they're in front of these city officials because they were doing what God called them to do. They were innocent but were wrongly accused. Has any of that ever happened to you guys? I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Lord, I'm going to church. I'm following all 10 of the commandments. I'm praying, I'm reading the Bible. I even go to a purple book group. I'm sharing about the Lord with others and then all of a sudden everything goes wrong. But Lord, I'm doing everything you told me to do. How do we respond? How do we act? Let's see exactly what happened to Paul and Silas when they were dragged in front of uh, the city officials. Acts 16, 22 through 24, read like this. 
a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer ordered to, the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet to stocks. In stocks. Whoa, that was a lot. Dragged, attacked by a mob, stripped, beaten with rods, thrown into prison, the inner dungeon, and put in the stocks. Now, just one of these things is enough for me, but all of them all at the same time? <sighs> so, <laughs> I, I, I guess I really want you to understand the dy dynamic of what is happening here. So we're going to do, what we're going to do is take a look at, because a lot of times Satan attacks our lives and he doesn't just attack us from one direction. He tries to come at all directions from us, for, for us. So we're going to take a look at what do, what do all of these things mean? What is the significance of what happened to Paul and Silas? So let's talk. Number one, they were dragged through the city. Now, the city officials were located on the public center or the marketplace of Philippi. So when they dragged them, they drug them through the public streets where people were gathered. They were shopping. So everybody in the city saw them. Who are these people being drugged down the streets, being drugged and brought up to the city officials? <laughs> so they got scraped, scratched, bruised, everything else being drugged through the city. What was meant by this? This was meant to embarrass them. Why else would you drag somebody through the city but did just to embarrass them in front of a whole bunch of people? We'll keep going. This is going to come together, I promise you. They were attacked by the mob. Some versions didn't say that they were attacked, but many of them say that they were attacked by the mob. So as the people saw them being dragged, they started joining in on the attack. Oh, this is what we're doing. So I could imagine they their things were thrown at them. They were kicked. They were spit on. <laughs> I'm sure they were called a few choice names. But this was meant to degrade them and make them feel as if they were below everyone else. That's what this was made to do. They were stripped. There's nothing more embarrassing than being stripped down in front of people, nevertheless people that are attacking you. This was, this was an attack on their integrity. They had nothing to protect themselves because they got stripped down. They were exposed in the worst way. This was meant to make them vulnerable. They were beaten with rods. Now these rods were made from branches of trees. Now I remember growing up and I would go to my grandmother's house during the summer. And whenever I was doing something I wasn't supposed to do, my grandmother would say, go get me a switch. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? Y'all yeah. know exactly. So you had to go out there, find that branch thing, and she would wear my legs out. <laughs> as much as that hurt, this was nothing compared to what Paul and Silas had to face. It was nothing. They were beaten. They were... <laughs> They were excru it was excruciating pain for them to be beaten by these rods. There weren't little sticks, there were rods that they're beating, extremely beating them. This was meant to cause them much pain. Mm. They were thrown into the prison. The inner dungeon is what they were thrown into. So they were locked up, their freedom was taken away. Now, think about this, a dungeon, dark, cold, damp. I can imagine there was probably bug infested and everything else in there. It was meant to discourage them so that they wouldn't have any hope at all. 
<laughs> and they were put into stocks. <laughs> they couldn't go anywhere. So these stocks, just so that you know, they were like two wooden boards and you had to sit down to put your feet inside of them. So when they couldn't even stand up in these things. They, had, they were bound, they had to sit down. They couldn't even stand up. So these stocks were meant to immobilize them. Finally, they, there was a guard there. You remember they said, make sure they don't escape. There was a guard that was placed outside. So just in case they got through the inner prison, the, the dungeon, the, all of these, the, the, the shackles on their feet, just in case they got through, there was a guard that was standing at the door that was there to kill them if they got out. <laughs> so this was meant to make them fearful. Let's bring this all together. Even though we are not in the same situation as Paul and Silas, it doesn't mean that Satan doesn't attack us the same way. He wants to embarrass. He wants to isolate. He wants to make us vulnerable. He wants to keep us broken. He wants us out of control, discouraged, hurt, and scared. But my question to you is, how do you respond when you feel like this? Do you complain? Do you pout? Do you get mad at everybody else and start yelling at people and have an attitude? Do you cry about it? Do you think that these responses will get you the results that you want and or need for God to do? Satan does all of these things to stop us from praying and worshiping. That's the purpose of them because he knows how much power that there is when we pray and worship. So he does everything that he can to defeat us, to make us feel defeated, to make us feel that there is no hope at all. So my question again, when you face these issues in life, who are you allowing to get the victory? Let's think about that. What do you do? How do you act? How do you respond? Let's take a look and see what Paul and Silas did. Acts 16, 25, the first part says, around midnight, everybody say midnight. midnight. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What? All of this stuff that I just told you about was going on and they weren't complaining to God. They weren't saying how unfair it is. They weren't begging God to deliver, from, deliver them from their situations or feeling sorry for themselves. They started praying and singing. Whoa. And you know, it says midnight here. Many people think, oh, they started praying and singing at midnight. Midnight. I don't believe that at all. I believe they were praying and singing the whole time. But at midnight is when the miracle happened. That's what I think happened. The miracle happened at midnight. I think this is a good word for somebody out here. We need to worship. We need to pray until we see the hand of God move. I don't care what time it is. Sometimes at your darkest midnight hour is when God's going to move. And if you're not on the fence praying, if you're not on the fence worshiping, you're going to miss it. You will miss it. So it's so important through the darkest times in my life, when I just pressed in, I'm like, God, I don't care. I don't care. I just need you to move. During those darkest times is when he said, okay. And he moved. And he, and my, wait, I'm missing. Can you guys hear me? He, he moved. He changed the situation. He moved some people out of my life that didn't need to be there. And he did a miracle just because I just, I, I, I refuse to give up. You're a God that loves me too much. I refuse to give up. That's what we have to do. That's who we have to be. <sighs> Such an encouragement that God gives us through Paul and Silas. But here's another thing. 
Do you know that other people are watching and listening to you? Take a look at what else happened when they were in prison. Acts 16, 25, part B. And the other prisoners were listening. I would imagine that they had never heard such prayers coming from a prison wall. Think about it, especially from the inner dungeon. What? Who prays and worships in the middle of all of that? <laughs> it was a place that was meant for people to be bound, for people to be isolated. There was, there was not supposed to be any hope. But because of Paul and Silas's prayers and worship, this place turned into a place of hope. It turned into a place of peace that they had never experienced before. I got a question. You guys listen carefully to this question. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Paul and Silas were imprisoned just for the benefit of those prisoners? Sometimes the things we go through in life are not about us. Period. It's not about us. We try to make it about us. Lord, help me. Lord, I need to get out of this for me, for my own personal reasons. But my question is, can you handle things temporarily not going your way in order for God to use you to reach other people? Amen? Amen. Amen. Please remember, people, there are people in this world that are in their own prisons. They are. They may not be in themselves, but they're in prisons of their mind. They have dark. It's dark. It's isolated. They're bound up, and they feel defeated by life. You have the ability through your prayers, through your worship, to point them to the Prince of Peace. Amen? And, and notice, Paul and Silas didn't even have a conversation with these men. He didn't lay hands on them. They didn't lay hands. They didn't do any of that. All they did was pray and worship, and God moved. So sometimes that's all we need to do is <laughs> what God calls us to do and praise and worship him through it all. Amen. It affects us, but it also affects those around us. Hmm. Let's see what happened next. Acts 16 and 26. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. suddenly. There was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All of the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner flew off. What? Talk about the power of prayer and worship. Satan thought he had Paul and Cyrus exactly where he wanted them. They were on the inside of the inside of the inside, bound, shackled. They weren't going anywhere. <laughs> There's no way they were going to get out. But then God steps in. He makes a statement in response to all of the attacks of the enemy. And he, God answers our prayers, y'all. He does. He answers our prayers. Check this out. So he has a response to everything that, that, that all that list of stuff that they were going through. Let me tell you what God had to say. <laughs> God caused an earthquake that shook the foundation. It was a massive earthquake. It wasn't one of those little 1.3 or whatever on the, on the Richter scale. It was a massive earthquake to shake the foundation of everything. God wants you to know that he is your foundation. He wants you to know that he and nothing else can take his place. He is the, so sometimes he's going to come in and shake some things up. Because sometimes we get out of alignment with him. He's going to shake it up just to show you who's in control. Amen? Amen? Number two, he opens the doors of the prison. It says they literally flew open. I'm going to tell you what. When my mama walks in the room and she flings that door open, she's saying something. So God is not just, he didn't just all oh, open the door. He flung them open. He was making a statement, y'all. 
When God opens a door, there is nobody in this world can, that can shut that door. So he is making that point here when he flung those doors open. <laughs> Don't ever, ever, ever let somebody tell you there's something that you can't do. Don't ever do that. Because with God, we already know all things are possible. Look at the situation with Paul and Silas. That looked like an impossible situation. But God. Amen? All right, next thing. The chains flew off. Again, they didn't just unlock. I imagine these things just came and flew across the room. Okay? There was no doubt that it was God. Because the earthquake is not going to cause these, these to go across the room. <laughs> what is God saying in that? God was saying, I'm giving you your freedom, is what he was saying. And the fact that they flew across the room says that he is making sure that you will be bound no more. That's what that meant. So he was making the point that they're not going to reuse these shackles on you because they're gone. He flung them across the room. But did you know this? Not only did they fall off of Paul and Silas, but they fell off of every prisoner. Every single one, they fell off. They flew off of every single one. Those prisoners that were listening, the prisoners that were leaned into the wall trying to hear as much as they could about this God that Paul and Silas were praying and worshiping about. The one that was giving them a glimmer of hope. The one that was giving them peace of mind. Those same prisoners were bound no more. And again, the Bible doesn't say this, but maybe those chains fell off, not only physically, but a sign of their spiritual freedom because they gave their lives to the Lord in, in prison. Amen. It would make sense. Why would they have fallen off if God didn't move and change some stuff in their lives? Now, y'all remember that guard that was placed outside of the prison because he was going to kill them if they were trying to get out? Well, I just want you to know, we're not going to read the whole thing, but he got saved, his entire family got saved, they all got baptized, they were all filled with joy as a result of Paul and Silas's praises to the Lord. Their family wasn't even there, but their lives were changed because changed because somebody else's worship, someone else's praise and prayers. Now, what were Paul and Silas praying? What were they worshiping? I don't know. But I would imagine, I know, that it did touch the heart of God, whatever it was that they did pray. So I want to encourage you guys with this. <clears throat> Never stop praying. Never stop worshiping. It's life-changing for everyone when we stay connected with our Father. It's our communication with God, and it allows, as we pray, our relationship with Him grows. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have a relationship with you that we can come to you about anything because you love us so much. Thank you for allowing me to be your child. Thank you that, that you love me so much that I am so near and dear to your heart. Lord, I trust you with these things that concern me. I trust that you love me so much that you're going to take care of these things because you're my Abba, my Daddy, my Father, the one that I come and sit on your lap just to feel and experience your heartbeat. Lord, thank you for being my Daddy. Lord, I just come to you right now in reverence. I bow down to you. 
I have awe and wonder for you, Lord Jesus. Your name is matchless. Your word says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. I am confessing that now, Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my King. You are my God. You are my everything. Jesus, thank you so much. Lord, I know that you reign. You reign. You rule in this earth. Everything here, me, everything here belongs to you. Lord, I align myself with you. Lord, may I see things the way that you see things. Not by these eyes that I can see physically, but spiritually, I want to see stuff like you do. So please, give me wisdom, give me insight, give me discernment so I can see what you see. So I can live how you want me to live. Allow me to see everything from your spiritual perspective. I want your will to be my will. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, now I, I humble myself and I ask you to move right now. I feel defeated sometimes. I feel hopeless sometimes. I feel worn down. I don't know which direction to go. I just don't know. But I know that you know. I know that you, I sometimes don't even have the right words to pray. Lord, I ask that you change my situation because I want to glorify you in all that I do and all that I say. I need your peace. I need your hope. I need your freedom in this. I am not worthy to come to you. I'm not worthy at all. There's nothing about me that is clean. But again, you are my father. And I am asking you to help me. Lord, I repent. I turn from my wicked ways, all the sin, all of the things. I've not always gotten it right. I know that. I messed up more times than I can even imagine, than I can even remember. I'm not even worthy again to come to you for anything. So please, Jesus, please forgive me, Lord, as I continue to honor you with my life. Please accept my heart right now. I bow down to you and I ask you to forgive me. Now, Lord, I just pray that you rescue me from anything that is coming against me. I know I'm going to face opposition. I know that things aren't always going to go my way. But I just ask that you give me strength to stand for what is right and resist what is wrong. Give me strength to do that. Give me strength to even know the difference between the two. <laughs> My dependence is on you, Lord. I acknowledge that you're the only way that I can live a holy life. I need your grace. I need your mercy every single day. Because I am nothing. I am nothing without you, Lord. So, Lord, even though I may not have prayed the right words, Lord, see my heart. See my heart in what I've prayed, Lord. I want you to be lifted up. I want you to be honored through all everything that I do every single day of my life, Lord. So I bless you. I lift you up. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. There is nothing in my life that will come before you. So I bless you today. And it's in Jesus name that I pray. Amen. Amen.
I just literally went through the Lord's prayer. I literally went through the Lord's prayer and just prayed it from my heart. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a power that comes when we do that. So what I want to say today, if you hear nothing else that I said today, we need to change this from the Lord's prayer to your prayer. Don't pray just what he said. Make it your own. Pray what he puts on your heart. Share your heart with him and it will cause him to move. Amen. Amen. I hope that blessed you guys. I hope that blessed you guys.